spoke to Mike Koy and Zaire Krieger and to Lian Gogali and Jacobina Gil, and I can imagine that you're already quite overwhelmed by all these women, I am for sure. Uh, but we still have three more award winners to come, which are Svetlana, Tikhanovskaya and Unicor. Um, but we will start with Nice Lengete. There she is. Um, and this morning, the award was presented to her by a famous Dutch writer. I think you all know her. She's only 24 years old, but she already wrote a book who sold more than 200,000 copies and is now being translated in multiple languages. It's called I'm Going to Live, Ik Ga Leven. And the book is about her and her strictly, strictly religious family um, that she grew up with. And she finally makes the radical decision to leave her family. Here she is, Lale Gül. Hi, Lale. Hi. Yeah, you can stand over here indeed, because then we're a bit more on the same height. Yeah, How are you? Biggest. I'm fine, thank you. Yeah. How are you? I'm fine too, yeah. Um, I just told about your book. And in your book, you describe how you slowly take distance of your family and especially the traditions that your family stand for. Um, and eventually, you even decide to take off your hat kerchief, your hof, mm -hmm. your hofduk. Um, what was the moment that you decided this? Well, I was feeling very unfree for uh, years, actually since my 14th age. So once I was 23, I was like, okay, it's now or never. Because I can choose to do it differently, and I can decide today, okay, I, um, I'm not caring anymore, and, or I can just give up and live the life that makes me unhappy every day. Um, I had to live by very strict conservative rules, and that just uh, was so difficult because it was everything, everything that gave me joy in life was actually forbidden by my family. So if I wanted to be happy and be my true self, then I just had to choose this path because I couldn't love the man I want because he was not from the same religion. I couldn't go to the beach in the summer because I had to cover my body and even my hair. And um, I couldn't drink a wine. I uh, had to um, dress or cover myself. I couldn't dress the way I want. I couldn't even go partying. Um, so those were very strict rules. I thought I can't do this any longer. Mm. So that was the moment I realized I had to choose my way. Yeah. And what was the re reaction of your family when you did that? They became very shocked at first and then very angry and also sad because it's very painful for them uh, because they really believe in, in the religious system and it's so painful if your uh, children do not and it's very hard for them to tolerate that because um, they are... Um, they think they have the absolute truth and if your child is um, living on a very, in a very different way, it's just um, so hard for them to even uh, see that happening. Hmm. So they uh, reacted with uh, giving me the chance to um, um, actually live my life like they want or, um, yeah, break the, the, you know, the wow. stop the contact. Yeah. Wow. Well, that is very intense, and um, I would like to talk about that more a bit later because I see a lot of similarities between you and Nice, and I'm, I'm curious about Nice, her story, and her perspective on your story. But first, have a look. Let's have a look at uh, a video of Nice Lengete. When I was young and growing up in my community in Kenya, girls and women did not have a voice in decision making. They were supposed to be silent, to be submissive to men and to the elders who are men in my community and who make all the important decisions. This inequality is at the root of many injustices faced by young women in Kenya, including female genital mutilation and child marriage. 
When girls marry young and do not have the opportunity to finish their education, it means they cannot be women of their dreams. The moment I had to act was when I was eight years old, and I was told that my older sister and I would be subjected to female genital mutilation, as it is the tradition in the Maasai community. I knew it was so painful. I knew some girls had died, so we ran away. A second moment was when girls started to come to me. When they had, I became the woman I wanted to be through education. And that's how A Nice Place was born. To end female genital mutilation in my community, my biggest challenge is convincing the elders, talking to decision makers, making them see the value of these girls. I cannot think of anything that would make me stop working for change until every girl is free from the threat of female genital mutilation and child marriage. Through her work, 20,000 Maasai girls have not been circumcised, Ms. Neda. And she wants every one of those girls to become the woman of her dreams. Please give a huge applause for a nice Lengete. You look very beautiful. Thank you. Yes. How does it feel to have earned this award? Uh, I would say it's a great honor mm -hmm. and uh, a big recognition also to the work that we are doing because it uh, gives us energy and motivation to continue mm -hmm. uh, doing more. Yeah. So I just uh, talked to Lale about uh, traditions and traditional family traditions. What was the moment when you realized um, you wanted to uh, campaign against the traditions of your family because they are not okay? Yeah, I realized that I wanted to really make change or circumcision for girls is not what I wanted when I was eight years old. Eight years old? Yes, because I lost my parents when I was six years old and I had to live with my grandfather. Mm. So I had a chance to go to a boarding school. And when I, was, when I was a young girl, remember my mother would wake me up as early as 4 a.m. to go and witness other girls when they're undergoing the cut. So I saw death, I saw girls leaving school when they're like 10 years old, they're married off, and that, that is not the life I wanted. So I couldn't change at that time because changing tradition, changing culture is not easy. But um, I knew my place was cool, and uh, I decided that finally I'll need to talk to my community and see whether they will allow me to go on with education. And you say in the video that the hardest challenge was to convince the elderly. Yeah. Um, how eventually did you convince them of the value of, of women? When you want to make change, especially when you are changing tradition, remember it's about changing mindset, it's about changing attitude and behavior. And it's a tradition that has been there for hundreds or thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So you can't change overnight. You can't just change like that. So it takes time. And mostly when we work uh, 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 on women issue or girls issue, we say we, or we look at men as our enemies. But what I've seen by doing this work is that you cannot change, make change by only talking to girls, by only talking to mothers. Elderly people, especially men and younger men, are important people in our community, and we cannot assume their position in leadership. So uh, we had to also have dialogue with them and ensure that they understand it's not okay to marry a 12-year-old girl. It's not okay to marry a 14-year-old girl. And we also had to talk to elders so that they understand, because we come from a community whereby if you marry a girl, you get cows in exchange for dowry. You get like three cows, four cows. So it's like business for them to have a girl or a daughter. Mm -hmm. So it's also important as we talk to them, we ensure that they are hearing where they'll get their cows from. And what we normally say, instead of marrying off your girl when she's 12 years or 13 years, 
wait until she's over 18 years when she can make better and informed decisions and probably even the dowry will go up because she might decide I want to be married or not. If the problem is cow, because she's an empowered woman, she has a job, she's educated, she can definitely bring back the cows that are important to our fathers. But uh, it's so not it an easy... An economical argument you yeah, also gave. Yeah, it yeah. is. So changing men is not easy because they want to marry the younger girls as a second or third wife because probably uh, the first one cannot walk for long to fetch for firewood or water and anything, so they will need a younger person to take care of. Mm -hmm. So it's a very difficult conversation, but we are happy with patience because I said you can't change in a day. It even took me two years for men to accept me to talk to them just because I'm a woman. Wow. But uh, patience is what we work with, mm -hmm. and uh, finally they were able to listen to me, and that's how they have been able to support us to reach the 20,000 girls we are talking about. Yeah. I did not do alone. I did with the support of men and women from that community and girls. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Lala, is there anything that you would like to ask Nice. Yes. Um, how did you develop the alternative rite of passage? Did you do it yourself? Did you get help with it? And how did people in the com community react to your proposals? What, was there a lot of resistance? Uh, maybe it needs some context, what, what the alternative rite of passage is. Because when girls turn a woman, mm -hmm. turn into a woman, yeah. there's normally um, a ceremony which used, used to include circumcision, mm -hmm. but that's now not anymore the case. But what is the al alternative? So the alternative rites of passage is a community-led movement where we are simply replacing the cut with education. Because investment in education uh, is very important when you are trying to end any form of gender-based violence. So what we are simply saying as the Maasai people, our culture is beautiful. We have so much that is good that we need to embrace. We're not saying everything in our culture is wrong. How we dress, our beautiful necklaces and jewelries, how our men jump high, you know, the love from that community and generosity, because that's what culture teaches you. You cannot get it any other place. And I always say there's a lot also the world can learn from, from our community. But also a culture that is taking away their dreams, a culture that is causing death, a culture that is not making them be able to go to school, that is a culture that deserves to die. So we look uh, on issues of child marriage and female genital mutilation, one, as a human rights-based approach. We look at it as a gender issue. We look at it as an economic empowerment issue because the elderly women who practice the cut, you are paid like $5 to uh, circumcise one girl. So as much as we are telling you the dangers of female genital mutilation, but how are we able to help you to come up with alternative sources of income because that's a job for you. We also look at it as an education issue. But was, what is more important is having structured dialogue. Uh, because we have laws against female genital mutilation almost in all countries in Africa, uh, maybe apart from one that are practicing mm. FGM. But laws itself cannot end FGM. They are important. People like us who are activists, we can walk freely and speak about it. Uh, but you need the law on one side and dialogue on the other side because it's a cultural issue that needs a cultural solution. Mm -hmm. And the alternative rites of passage is not a solution to every community that practices female genital mutilation. Mm -hmm. We have the uh, northern part of Kenya whereby more it's Muslim. They mm -hmm. do it because of purity or hygiene, so yeah. it doesn't make sense to do an alternative rites of passage. Mm -hmm. But in the Maasai community I come from, it's a rite of passage from girlhood to womanhood. Yeah. It's what makes you as a woman to be accepted and uh, it's what prepares you to be a woman so that you can be married off. So, and we said, uh, after looking at it like that, women and men, again, cannot sit down and talk about these issues together. So we decided to separate forums. We have what we call the mother to girl forum. Mothers and daughters yeah. sit down. So and talk together yeah. about sexual and reproductive yeah. rights and what it entails to be yeah. a woman. I, I, I would like to, because there's someone that would really like to ask okay. you a question. Mm -hmm. Is it OK? Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, his name uh, or her name is Annie Zwart. Um, and I think she's on the screen. Ms. Lengate, 
Did you ever have a situation where you couldn't get your point across because of a male who thinks his opinion is superior? Hmm. Okay. If uh, you've ever been in a situation where you couldn't get your point across because the male thinks he is superior in his position? Yeah, you know, I come from a community whereby as a girl, you are supposed to be silent and you're not supposed to talk in front of men. Mm -hmm. And um, as I said, it's a very sensitive cultural issue. It's not easy for people to open up. It's not easy for you to discuss with people. And when you go to the community for the first time, there is a lot of resistance. And especially men would want, not want to hear because they say you're taking away our wives from us, you mm -hmm. know, the younger girls and all that. So it's not easy. Uh, but what I try to use in my work, I think the few things I've learned sometimes is to talk less and listen more. Mm -hmm. Because whenever you have this conversation, you're talking about sensitive issue, don't think you know everything. Always listen to the other people. Yeah. They will tell you a hundred reasons why they think it's right. Listen to them and tell them, okay, that's what you thought. At that point, maybe it had a meaning, but we are simply saying it's wrong because of one, two, ten reasons that yeah. we are talking about. Yeah. And the other thing is also not to judge them and treat them with a lot of love, because if you start judging people, remember, they will not also listen to you. So resistance has been there, but uh, I must say, uh, I had to identify allies in my work. Who are these men who are supporting my work? Mm. Remember, sometimes I can't walk to a meeting alone. I identify people who support me, we go together. Yeah. Uh, he can speak first, I speak second, or either way, yeah. and that is how we've been able uh, to work on it. I want to thank you so much to share your story, but most of all for all the work that you do. Thank Not you. only for the women in your community, but I think you are a big inspiration for a lot of women all around the world. Thank you. And I think some more people know you by now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nice, thank you.